Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 141 of the American Muslim Experience, and I am joined by my co-host, Omar Ansari. Greetings to all the listeners. Good to be back after celebrating the 10th anniversary. Uh, thanks, yeah. for, thanks for doing that episode, and, no, and no, uh, congrats on, on the milestone. Uh, looking forward now to the next 10 years. That's right. Well, you're part of at least half of that history, so yeah. Uh, about, about 40% yeah, so far, so I'm making, tra- I'm making tracks. Though. That's right, that's right. <laughs> so this was the episode that we teased on, uh, on social media as well, of wanting to have conversation around what's happening right now in Palestine. Uh, and I couldn't think of a better guest, uh, and we're just lucky to have him here at the University of California, Berkeley. So why don't you tell us who we have on the show? Yeah, welcome, uh, Dr. Osama Mekthesi. He's a professor of history and chancellor's chair at the University of California at Berkeley, where we are actually located and recording right now. He was previously professor of history and the first holder of the Arab American Educational Founda- Foundation Chair of Arab Studies at Rice University in Houston. Uh, during the academic year of 2019-2020, uh, Professor McDessey was a visiting professor at UC Berkeley in the Department of History. Prior to that, he was an invited resident uh, at the Institute for Advanced Study in Germany uh, in Berlin. And he was awarded the Berlin Prize and spent the spring of 2018 as a fellow at the American Academy of Berlin. His most recent book, Age of Coexistence, The Ecumenical Frame and the Making of the Modern Arab World, was published in 2019. He's the author of Faith Misplaced, The Broken Promise of U.S. Arab Relations. His previous books include Artillery of Heaven, American Missionaries in the Failed Conversion of the Middle East, uh, and several others, including um, having won several awards, uh, for example, the co-winner of the 2009 British Kuwait Friendship Society book prize given by the British Society for Middle Eastern Studies. Just continuing, he's published widely on on Ottoman and Arab history, as well as on U.S.-Arab relations and U.S. missionary work in the Middle East. He has major articles published, for example, Anti-Americanism in the Arab World and Interpretation of Greece History. And he has published in the International Journal of Middle Eastern, Middle East Studies, Comparative Studies in Society and History, and in the Middle Eastern Report. So many credentials here. I could keep going. We're super excited to have Professor McDissey here. Welcome. Uh, very excited to have this conversation. Thank you so much. And it's great to be with you guys. And uh, congratulations on your 10th year. Oh, no, thank you so much. We uh, often like to kind of uh, have our guests start off by just sharing a little bit about their background, um, kind of where you grew up, what obviously brought you into academia. And I know prior to this, you were at Rice University, my old hometown. So we can definitely get into that a little bit. And I know that I'm not going to bury the lead, but you're also related to the late, great uh, Edward Said. So we'd love to talk a little bit about that as well. So yeah, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, my background is, you know, the most basic level. I was born in D.C., but I grew up in Lebanon because my parents moved back uh, to Lebanon when I was three. And, uh, you know, I grew up there during the Civil War period. And uh, uh, in a family of, uh, of, of educators, basically. Um, yes, my mother is Edward Said's sister. Um, and of course, my father is <clears throat> a professor, uh, was a, or is a professor, a retired professor now at the American University of Beirut, where my grandfather also taught, um, and my younger brother teaches, and a cousin of mine teaches. So we have a very strong uh, history and investment in education and in humanizing and uh, historicizing the the Arab world and contemporary Arab history. So that's a very, and I came to the U.S. Uh, when I finished high school in Lebanon. I went to Wesleyan University. Okay. Um, and then I went, did my, then I went back to Lebanon right after the last month of the war in Lebanon. I went back when I finished university in 1990. Um, I went back for the last month. Uh, I got there just before the war, the last battle really of the war. And then I taught in my old high school for a year, um, which was an amazing experience because it was just as the war ended and Lebanon was opening up for the first time between the different parts. Um, it really was an extraordinary experience. Um, and then I went to graduate school at Princeton and from Princeton to Rice, where I spent 25 great years at, at a fantastic institution um, with phenomenal colleagues for the most part, not, not everyone, of course. Um, and then I moved here to Berkeley. So got it. And you did a, a stint as a visiting professor before yeah. making the move. Okay. Yeah. And this is your second year then here. This is my second full, this is the beginning of my second or yeah, this right, is the second right. full academic year. Now we're really fortunate to have you. Like I said, I, I had been following you on social media uh, and you mentioned something. Oh yeah. The uh, American university uh, in Beirut, you know, you're here in warriors territory. Uh, Steve Kerr uh, 
like his father, is that right? Yeah, his father was was the president, Malcolm Kerr, yeah. was the president of AUB and mm -hmm. was assassinated right. when I was in high school or in, yeah, in high school. You remember that? Yeah, yeah of course yeah. I remember that. Right, yeah. right. And, and then your uncle, uh, Dr. Said, he was at Princeton for a while? He was an undergraduate yeah. at Princeton. Uh, okay, that's what I remember. Yeah. There, I knew there was something with Princeton. Where we are in the moment, uh, you know, this past week, there was uh, a, a lecture by Professor Elon Pape gave at UC Berkeley, where he warned us to to not dehistoricize the attacks of October 7th, just about two weeks ago. So let's start there. Um, what led us to the October 7th, you know, Hamas incursion attack? Because I think a lot of what happens is sort of history begins on October 7th, if you listen enough to the media. And so the purpose here, I think uh, I, I should have said this at the outset, is to hopefully educate the unin uninitiated layperson, someone who's never concerned themselves with what's happening with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, as well as, you know, hopefully offer some insights for people who are, in, you know, informed activists or consumers, uh, and then at the same time dispel the misinformation and propaganda that, unfortunately, the average American consumes and is fed, uh, especially when these things flare up. So, uh, if you can then maybe in that within that context kind of yeah. we examine what brought us yeah, here. Yeah, that'd be great. Now, and one thing... Um, I think would be helpful is helping us understand where this lie, where this event and the, these last few weeks lie in the kind of the big scheme. Like, are they to what extent are they a big deal versus yet another conflict? I think that would be helpful as well. I think that's a good place to go. Yeah. To. Well, the first thing, of course, I mean, exactly as you said, uh, that that the decontextualization and the dehistoricization in the sense of the erasure of history has been profound in in, in the reaction in the West to the events of October 7th. And of course, the way any historian or anyone with any knowledge of this region or any sense of that, that there are people who live in this region with history knows perfectly well that this, um, this, this conflict is a war that's been being waged on the Palestinians for a hundred years. Going back to 1917, the Balfour Declaration, uh, the creation of the British Mandate, the dispossession of the Palestinians in 1948, the Nakba, uh, which means the catastrophe in Arabic. In other words, the forced, coercive, um, uh, coerced uh, uh, ethnic cleansing, as Ilan Pape's book, uh, 2006, uh, puts it. The ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians in 1948, the occupation of the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem in 1967. Hamas wasn't even founded until 1987. That's right. And you know, and so here we are in 2023, and all this is clearly rooted in an extraordinarily violent um, dispossession of the Palestinians that has been ongoing. And it doesn't matter whether one sort of you know supports one side, so called, or the other side. The reality is that the history is there. It's it's almost there's almost no doubt amongst most professional historians or people who study this region of the basic narrative. The only question that people have is. Oh, is it justified to ethnically cleanse or not? And some is Benny Morris, for example, Israel's, uh, I wouldn't say his greatest, its greatest historian, but certainly the most famous historian says, yes, the ethnic cleansing was justified in 48. And people like Ilan Pape, on the other hand, of course, have uh, a much more humane, much more sort of secular, a much more um, uh, compassionate and, and honest right. interpretation. Of what happened in 1948 and the consequences still today. So my point to any layperson listening to this is go go read, go go read the histories. They're widely available. Yes, as you said, uh, Parvez, there's a lot of propaganda out there. But uh, the more you read, and that's what I tell all my students, right. read widely. Mm -hmm. The more you read, the more you will realize very quickly that this is not a history that begins on October 7th. Can you do like an Exhibit A, Exhibit B, and maybe summarize? The common narrative in the West or in America or in yeah. mainstream media today sure. versus your um, historical understanding as a prof as a scholar, just and and really for the, for the sure. for the for the listeners, orient us that way and kind of point out the the flaws of the of the common under, commonly understood narrative among among Americans. I guess you could say. Well, I mean, the common the mainstream narrative basically, and and the narrative that is relentlessly propagated by not just the mainstream press, but also by people in power, by Biden, by the Democrats, by the Republicans. It doesn't really matter, really. Um, We're uh, there, there's extraordinary consensus, or there has been, 
consensus. Now you have a few solitary voices in the wilderness in Congress who are actually speaking truth to power from within the very halls of power. But the mainstream narrative is very simple. It's, it just assumes that there's no history bef yeah. for the Palestinians that's of any significance and that they just come out of the blue, that Israel is good. They, the starting point of all the history, Israel is there, it's good. And it's attacked violently. This is the mainstream narrative. It's attacked violently out of the blue by terrorists who attack because they are terrorists. This is the, main, this is the, the circular logic of mainstream media who attack because they're terrorists. And therefore, Israel, quote, has a right to defend itself. We've heard this phrase a million times. Um, and whatever Israel does is, is just. Now, Israel, of course, can, in the mainstream narrative, can, can exceed and can be disproportionate. And now you're beginning to see voices of that. As we now move in today, I was just checking the figures, uh, 20,000 Palestinians have been killed or wounded so far in Gaza. Uh, it's an extraordinary, it's extraordinary, it is extraordinary sort of brutalization. Uh, but again, in the, in the mainstream narrative, this is all a retaliation for the Palestinians who provoke this by being terrorists and attacking. It's a simple, that's, it's that misleading, it's that obscene, it's that absurd, a narrative, but it's simple and it's easy. And then when you try to say, well, that's, that is completely misleading because the history is that the Palestinians are dispossessed, occupied, brutalized, stateless population that have been subjected to the most inhumane siege in Gaza since 2006-7 and are besieged in Gaza and have been besieged in Gaza. They have no access to the air or the water. Israel controls all the borders except one crossing to Egypt, with the, which the Egyptian state has closed most of the time and controls. So in other words, we're talking about a population of 2.2 million people um, in the Gaza Strip, which itself is a creation of Israel's creation in 1948, which was created at the expense of the Palestinians who were yeah. pushed out of their homes and lands and made refugees into Gaza. So 70% of the population of Gaza uh, are refugees or descendants of refugees from Palestine. And so most people have no idea about this history. Right, right. Since, since, we're to, since, so, you, since history is the thing that's been forgotten, does it make sense to very briefly talk about what I think it does, things yeah. look like? prior to 1948 for sure and, and, and whether it's demographics or even just how where people were living and what right. that yeah. because that's also part of the narrative that this was a this was a piece of land that didn't wasn't really i mean it, it was occupied by peoples but these peoples laid no claim to the land yeah. i mean that's yeah, the that's, argument that's you the, hear that's the that's the racist orientalist uh, myth and it's then, a land without a people for a people without a land I, that I, was that was a zionist slogan you know again the thing is, honestly, when you look at the history, when you study the history, when you humanize Palestinians and you historicize them, yeah. and you historicize not just the Palestinians, all peoples in that region, mm -hmm. whatever, they, whatever we call them today, um, all those peoples, you realize very quickly that Palestine belonged to a much wider region. It was connected to what is today Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt. Um, it was part of the Mashriq, the mm -hmm. Arab East. It was under Ottoman uh, control and domination for 400 years, but there were links, trade links, social links, family links, food links, cultural links, uh, all sorts of links, economic links, and networks that expanded, that connected this region, Palestine, to everything around it. So that's the first point. The second point is that this is a history, a place that has a profound multi-religious um, background and, and history. Muslims, Christians, and Jews have all being in Palestine, all think of it as extraordinarily important from a religious and spiritual point of view, mm -hmm. if they're pious. Um, and if they're not, they still live there in what I, in the, my last book, it was, it's called An Age of Coexistence, precisely to emphasize this point that this was a multi religious place, land, and people. And so once you put those two pieces together, and it was like every other part of the world, there were more developed, less developed towns and villages, mm -hmm. um, rich people, poor people, you know, pious people, less pious people, good people, bad. I mean, like any like any society, it's a, it's a living. It was an, a living society with a real history. And once you acknowledge that, you realize how how racist and colonial the European imposition of a fantasy of a Jewish state that was, did not come out of the Jewish communities of the Middle East or Palestine or the Arab world or the Ottoman Empire. Zionism, which was this idea of creating a Jewish state, 
was invented and elaborated in Europe. I'm talking about 19th century Zionism, modern Zionism, political Zionism, the idea of creating a Jewish state. It didn't come out of the Jewish communities of the Middle East. It came out of Europe in response to European anti-Semitism, in dialogue with European nationalism and in response to European nationalisms. Um, and of course, in the context of 19th century European ideas about the non-West, which is that the non-West was disposable, mm -hmm. empty, to be colonized, uncivilized, barbaric, and so on and so forth. Right. And so you, so these are all, do you see what I'm saying? So Zionism yeah. does not reflect and did not reflect the lived experience of the Jewish communities of the East. You say this to people and it shocks them because they always conflate Zionism and Israel That's right. with the Jewish people. And the reality is the history is much more complex, much more interesting, and it's completely contrary to this kind of myth that we keep being told that you cannot separate between Zionism on the one hand, which is a political ideology, and Jewish history, which is, of course, diverse and rich and profound. So and, that's, and you yeah. kind of described, like, obviously it was a regular society. Are you talking about uh, the entire Palestinian society? The entire uh, part of land, which is Israel today. Um, was that, and just to me, you talk a little about demographics and well, the, religious diversity and things like that. What did it look like? Well, the demographics um, are, the it was overwhelmingly Arab, mm. obviously, by, in, right. in, in, by the turn of the 20th century. Not, over 90% of the population was Arab. And by Arab, I mean Muslim and Christian, and even Jewish Arab. I mean, mm. overwhelmingly Arab. Um, and the, the Jewish population um, was less than 10%, far less than 10%. And the Zionists, is the, the crucial point is to separate Zionists from local Jew, Arab or Sephardic or, or Eastern Jews. The Zionists who came from Europe, remember, this is a European ideology. That's right. A nationalist ideology born in Europe, born in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, and eventually um, embraced by Western Europe. Uh, remember that Zionism does not reflect or did not reflect the aspirations, the culture, the, the history of the Middle East. And so that is a crucial part of, of this history. And, okay. so and Zionism no, is an idea that's born or that predates World War II. Yeah, for sure. And absolutely. we should also yeah, make yeah, that yeah, point. Absolutely, of course. It's, right. it's a nineteenth century it's a nineteenth century sort of ideology that develops and eventually uh, you know, there are famous Zionist thinkers and uh, writers and theorists like Theodor Herzl, mm -hmm. who again is not from the Middle East. And you look at every single major Zionist leader in this period, Theodor Herzl, Chaim Weitzman, who becomes the first president of Israel, David Ben Gurion, who becomes the first prime minister, prime minister. of Israel. Mm -hmm. Not one of these people is from Palestine or born in the Middle East. This is something that is absolutely essential to understand, to appreciate just how foreign this ideology was to this pluralist, diverse, uh, multi-religious part of the world that did not have ethno-religious nationalisms. Exactly. And so this was coming in from Europe, imposed on the Palestinians yeah. through the British Mandate, which was created in 1920, the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration is 1917. Okay, right. But then and there's then also that paves the, the way to the mandate, which then is established in the 1920s. Sykes Pico is 1916. 1916. So I can okay. go into that history yeah. if you want. But no, but because I think to Omar's point about the land, because yeah. the other thing we have to realize is that the the boundaries and and the designations that we have today are born out of a European, you know, partition. World, partition. 100. Exactly. percent Yeah. There's no. There were no. Like the idea of saying one is a Palestinian and one is a Lebanese That's right. is a myth of, or is a, not so much a myth, it's a product, product. Of, a product of the partition and division of this region. That's right, which happens after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, for sure. Which happens uh, after, uh, yeah, after World War One. For sure, and it's mm -hmm. important not to romanticize coexistence. I mean, you know, coexistence. I like, yeah, you is, do that in your book. It's a variable thing. I mean, exactly. There, there are moments like, but that is a function of any pluralist society. There's no such thing as simply everyone gets along and everyone yeah. loves each other and so on yeah. and so forth. No, there's tensions, there are real tensions. That's right. But it's important, again, to historicize those tensions. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to emphasize that Zionism was foreign, and that's part of, yeah. and the only way it could be imposed on Palestine was through British colonial imposition. So the alliance between the Zionist leaders, like Weizmann, who had a major part in the elaboration of the Balfour Declaration, where the British government in 1917 says, you know, we, we view with favor the establishment in Palestine, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting, I mean, it's not exactly, you can go check the actual paragraph, but basically the British government views with favor the establishment of a Jewish, of a, a, a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine, um, and they contrast the Jewish people in that 
paragraph with non-Jewish communities. So even in the even in the declaration, there's a privileging of Jews over non-Jews. The, mm. the, the Balfour Declaration does not refer to Palestinians or Arabs as Palestinians or Arabs, just so, as non-Jews, just as the, ne the negative. Yeah. yeah, it's incredible. The, the Balfour Declaration uh, came after came around the nineteen late nineteen tens, early nineteen November nineteen seventeen. Nineteen seventeen. So maybe um, obviously leading up to the the Nakba, which is I think worth describing for our listeners. 48. What were the what? Maybe you could describe the major moments. Yeah, for um, sure. Post yeah. that Balfour Declaration. Yeah. In, in whether it's the post World War One, but sure. and then leading up to the Nakba, yeah. what did what was happening? What ha what did those what well did those I major mean, events look like? Could I, yeah, I, I, I you know again quoting a Professor Pape from the other night? You know, I think he really succinctly captured what the essence of the Zionist project is or was is to want as much as Palestine as possible with as few Palestinians for as sure, possible. Absolutely, and I mean, so I think that really kind of answers Omar's question. I mean, that, that, that's what occurs between that period. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm really yeah. trying no, to no, understand. I know, well, I know, that, I know. That's what occurs at one level. Yeah. At another sure. level, of course, yeah. what occurs Thank is you. that Palestinians are resisting and mobilizing Thank you. and elaborating their own sense of, of who they are in, a, yeah. in the modern world. Mm. But remember that that the, the great problem of Zionism, as, as part of as you just alluded to, is that the Zionist leaders, despite the racism towards Easterners and towards the, the non-West and because remember, again, this is a 19th century European ideology right. that is addressing European anti-Semitism and European nationalism and is shaped and formed by European racial tropes about the non-West, for sure. So okay. all these things are working together. When these people uh, come to Palestine, they realize very quickly, oh my God, there are people here. There mm. are not just people here, there are a lot of people here. Right. Oh my God, how are we going to build a Jewish state if there are so many Arabs? And this is the contradiction that is at the heart of colonial Zionism from the, in fact, all the way till today. Okay. I mean, that's it really it's all the way till today because Palestinians are still there. And, and so, and so they, the, 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 the British of course come in and the British are extraordinarily damaging, um, extraordinarily arrogant, extraordinarily racist, um, imperialist of course. And, and these are terms that one doesn't use lightly. In other words, the British basically set up the entire structure of the mandate. In other words, the colony, the occupation of Palestine, the, the state of Palestine that they create uh, as part of the mandate, it's the only mandate. So there are mandates that, that the West creates after World War I, what used to be a common one single territory under the Ottomans, for all the problems of the Ottomans. Nevertheless, it was one territory where people could move back and forth between different places. The British and the French carve up this region in line with Sykes-Picot, which is a secret agreement that they had signed in 1916. Uh, the British and the French together. They carve up this region into various states. In each of these states, in theory, in, in other words, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Mesopotamia, in, in these states, the idea was that the British or the French, depending on which part, which country we're talking about. Who got the piece of the pie. Yeah. We're going to help the native peoples towards self-determination. This was the myth. This was because Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, who was, of course, the, the U.S. president at the time, uh, another notorious sort of segregationist and, and racist in his own right, but nevertheless had sort of to, to steal the thunder of the Bolsheviks and the, had also sort of um, elaborated or, or suggested that there could be this idea of self-determination, by which he never meant freedom or liberation for peoples in the non-West. He just meant that peoples in the non-West should have a say in how they are going to be ruled by Western colonial powers. <laughs> okay. Peoples, of course, in the third world, what we call the third world, understood self-determination exactly the way we understand it today, which is, oh, that means we get to determine our own future. But of course, that's not what the Western powers wanted. And so the, the British and the French, as a sop to Wilson in 1919, basically say, you know what? We're gonna help these people, guide them to independence in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq except Palestine. The one mandate where the British said nothing about the native population, they said, we're here to put into effect the Balfour Declaration. We're going to create a Jewish national home. We're going to recognize the Zionist movement when they didn't recognize a Palestinian movement. They didn't recognize a Palestinian body. They didn't even recognize an Arab secular body. They just, the, the only thing that the British wanted was Palestine to be quiet while the Zionists were allowed to come in, they were privileged administratively, 
educationally, uh, politically, of course, and militarily. And so when the Palestinians, of course, were, were upset, understandably, because they were being told, your land is going to be transformed into a Jewish state. More, I mean, there was the, the phrase was a national home, but everyone in Palestine increasingly understood what this meant, that they were going to be dispossessed to make way for a Jewish state. And that was their fear. Beginning in the 19, right after the Balfour Declaration, all the way through the Nakba of 1948. So if you think about that period. Yeah. So they petition okay. peacefully. They appeal. They're ignored. They speak. They're ignored. They rally. They're ignored. They rebel. They're crushed. They have a major revolution in the 1930s. They're smashed. The greatest, one of the great interwar anti-colonial revolutions. The two major anti-colonial revolutions of the interwar period between World War I and World War II. Mm-hmm. One is in Syria and the other is in Palestine. And, and what happens there? They're both they're both. No, what, what was going on there, just as a background? In where? Syria? In, in the Palestinian Revolution in the 1930s. Well, I mean, the, basically there was a, there was a, the, 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 the British kept protecting the Zionist structure. They wouldn't relent on the Zionist structure. They kept allowing European, mostly European Jews, to emigrate into Palestine, to immigrate into Palestine, sorry, and uh, to, to colonize, to settle. And, and remember, the Zionists also didn't hide the fact that they were a colonialist movement. I mean, that would, because there was no shame in Europe in the 19th and early 20th century to be a colonialist. That was what Europeans did. And so um, they, and, and the more Palestinians were dispossessed, kicked off land, and eventually brutalized by the British and by the Zionists um, in, in, the revo- in the revolution when the, when the British crushed because the Palestinians rose up eventually. They said, enough is enough. Right. We've been told time and again that you're here to protect our, at least our civil and religious rights, but that's being taken away. Right. Everything is, we're being, we're being ignored completely. That's right. And we're the indigenous population and we have political rights. Why is it that every other state in this region is allowed self-determination, is allowed a form of representation? And the British refused that because, of course, the British and the Zionists both understood from day one, no representation, no democracy, no self-determination in Palestine until the Jews are a majority, which is, the, which is what they, and the Palestinians understandably were, were upset. And when they rebelled, they were smashed and they were brutalized by the British. So and this is the 1930s. The question I have is why, how is, and I think you, you, you alluded to this, but how, how, do, how do the Zionist or the Zionist um, project find such a receptive audience in, in, in Britain? That's an excellent question. That's a complicated question. There's okay. two basic or three basic answers that yeah. people, that historians give. And if you can tie in the eschatological, like is there an yeah, es- yeah, eschatological yeah. component? So there is this, this so-called Christian Zionist sort right. of idea that, that's been, that, that a lot of scholars today focus on, which is to say that there is a, an idea, um, uh, an almost entirely Western Christian um, idea, Protestant yeah. specifically, idea of the of the um that that's been floating around for 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 centuries that that the jew the the return of the jews to palestine um is an essential component uh, and i'm summarizing here a much more complicated thing but is an essential component uh for the second coming of christ and then of course you have various sort of plays on that theme like you have the more sort of what we today call evangelical christians who believe in something called uh, you know dispensations and so on? And I mean, I don't want to get into all the, the theories, but basically, that they believe that that you need to the Jews need to go back to Palestine. Of course, this is Christian theory. This is this is theology. This is um, um, speculation. Mm-hmm. It's not actual history. Nor, of course, does it in any way, shape, or form acknowledge or deal with the fact that there are people on the ground called Palestinians. In other words, a, a living population, an indigenous population. They're completely ignored. Right. In that eschatology, they're completely ignored in that sort of in that biblical Christian Zionist thought. Because remember, these are Christian Zionists sitting in America or in Europe, and they're just they're just theorizing. Right. It's like, it's like a fantasy. It has nothing to do with the actual reality of his of Palestine. Not to mention the fact that so, when when we talk about biblical narratives, I mean even the even the term f- Philistine or, or or Palestine is is a, is a derogatory for term sure for sure that's invented by the Romans. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole, you know, uh, overlooking a denial of Palestinian history and humanity, humanity in this Christian Zionist thought. So that's one aspect. And some people, like Lloyd George, uh, the British leader in this pivotal period in, around World War One, and and Balfour himself, Arthur Balfour, the British 
foreign secretary who was the author of the Balfour Declaration, at least right. um, they were all committed ideologically, intellectually, and certainly politically to, Christ to Zionism, partly right. out of this Christian Zionist idea that, that again, sees the world in terms of you know, Christians and Jews and doesn't see Eastern Christians as an Arab Christians That's who, of true. course, lived in Palestine, who were always ignored in this. And of course, Muslims are not even, are just not even considered. Very good They're point. Just, Very good so point. that's one aspect. The other aspect, which I think is, is just as important, is the fact that you had um, a lobbying. You had a, a Zionist movement led by people like Weizmann, who was based in the UK in this period. And they were very effective lobbyists. I mean, they put huge pressure on the British government. And the record is abundantly clear. You can go read any number of articles. You can go look at the archives. It's not a, it's not a secret. They, they were organized and they were lobbying and they had a movement. So that's important too. And the third factor is, of course, general, uh, I would say, absolute racist, you know, um, a lack of, uh, of any kind of serious concern with the history uh, or even an acknowledgement that Palestinians and Arabs and Asians and Africans have significant history. It's, it's completely irrelevant to how they think about this place called Palestine. So when they think about what are we going to do with Palestine after the war, it's the, the, the Arabs the, who are the majority of the population, the vast majority of the population are simply bodies that pose a problem. What do we do with this population? Not how do we fulfill our commitment to self-determination. No. Mm -hmm. There are bodies that have to be dealt with, pacified by the British and then ethnically cleansed by the Zionists eventually. And and just leading up to that, I want to also we, we talked about major events and get, giving our listeners a bit of context about uh, the major events leading up to the Nakba. What does what's happening in terms of the immigration? Yeah, you, you talk about people moving in. Yeah. Were they Zionists? Were they mostly people in the area? And then, of course, leading up to World War II, the Holocaust, and then the massive right. immigration from as far as Eastern from, Europe and beyond. Uh, but what does it look like prior to that? Prior to the Nakba, you mean? If prior, prior to the Nakba yeah. and leading up to it, and then yeah, I mean, obviously, the so the Jewish well. population in Palestine increased massively in okay. the Mandate period, in yeah. part because the British, mainly because the British structure of the Mandate allowed Palestinians no control over who would come in to Palestine. Yeah, the reason I asked that question is because I, what I've heard as the kind of the con from the, the layman, I guess you could say, is. Uh, no, there were there were Jews prior to. It wasn't just after the Holocaust; they were there for a long time. And but you're giving a little more color. Of course, there were Jews. I mean, yeah. I, I, of course, there were Jews. In of Palestine, course, there were Jews. Palestine, Palestine, I, in Palestine, yeah, yes, of yeah, course, yeah, there were yeah. Jews. It's a multi-religious land. I mean, right. of course, there were Jews. Right, yeah. but they were they were a minority. Anti-Zionism or the opposition to Zionism in Palestine is the opposition to a colonial movement. It is not an opposition to Jews. The reality of Thank Jews you. in the Middle East. That's right. Because everyone, including Muslims, of course, recognize that that is a basic part of the history of this region. Mm -hmm. no, nobody with any intelligence honestly denies that, that fact. That's different from saying that European Zionists who have a fantasy of creating a pure ethno-religious nationalist state in Palestine are right. Mm -hmm. Because the violence that they did we see right now, yeah. still unfolding before our eyes right now. Right. So anyway, to go to, to, to go back to the question about, yes, there were many Jews, of course, and there was a massive increase in the population, the Jewish population in Palestine in the 1930s in particular because of the rise of Nazism in Europe. Right. Remember, again, Zionism is, was created in response to European problems. Mm -hmm. And as these problems became more acute, more devastating, more racist with the rise of Nazi, especially Nazi anti-Semitism. Uh, and the US, of course, had its doors shut to Jews as to all other non-Western people, <laughs> right? Right, Because this, there were racist immigration quotas in this country. Oh, yeah. And the other Europe, West European countries didn't want uh, more Jews in their country. So they, they were encouraged to go to Palestine. Because remember, the Europeans are also anti-Semitic. The, the, the great irony that people misunderstand is how many profoundly anti-Semitic European and U.S. leaders support Zionism right. and have supported Zionism um, because it's about your, your, your take. And in fact, many of the critics of Zionism, including British Jewish members of the one British member, Jewish member of uh, uh, the Balfour's cabinet or the Lloyd George's cabinet in World War I, Montague was his name, 
he was an anti-Zionist. And he said, this is a completely mm. anti-Semitic document, the Balfour Declaration, because you're basically saying, Jews don't belong here, they belong in Palestine. And so, of course, there was a, uh, and you, you can't blame Jews in Europe who were being persecuted. European Jews and German Jews in particular were being persecuted by the Nazis who wanting to, to find shelter somewhere. That, of course, is a human and completely understandable. There's no, I mean, but within the structure of the mandate, this racist colonialist mandate that denied the Palestinians any form of self-determination and also that put all the burden on saving European Jews on the Palestinians, not on the Americans or on the Europeans who created that problem to begin with. That's it's right. astonishing. I mean, they, they, the hypocrisy of Europe and the United States on this is, we see it until today. It's an unbelievable story. So yes, the Jewish population increased for sure. It more than doubled in size. But even by 1948, the Jewish population was, the, 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 was only 30%. This is with all the massive immigration waves of you know immigration into uh, immigration into Palestine. Um, it was still a minority of the population, a substantial minority at this point, and and of course you know in the context of the Zionist structure of the British Mandate. I'm not using that word lightly because the British privileged Zionism officially recognized it, and at the same time as a smashed Arab opposition. Um, in that context, of course, many people became Zionists. Many of these Jewish um, uh, refugees and settlers became Zionists right. and ended up fighting with the Zionists because they saw it as an existential struggle. So let's fast forward to 1948. In 1948, we have the official creation of the State of Israel. Correct. Uh, by that time, as you mentioned, there's maybe about 40%, 30, 40%. 30 uh, something. I think yeah, it's 30%. Correct. Yeah, a Jewish sure. population. Check, go, again, sure, go sure. check the figures. Sure, sure. So we can be certain. Yeah, and then in terms of governing body, in terms of elect, like No uh, elections in Palestine. Okay. You mean after Israel or before Israel? After. No, okay, wait, hang on. So first of all, uh, up until, first of all, to, for, the re, for the listeners, yeah. remember, it's important to understand that when Israel was created, it was created as a result of, of course, as a result of war and, and colonialism, but also as a result of a UN partition resolution okay. that was passed Please. in November of 1947. And that and resolution stated? That uh, divides, yeah. Palestine, part, divides Palestine, it's called a partition, divides Palestine into two states. It gives the minority a majority of the land, the perverse irony of it. And even in the, in the, the putative or the, the Jewish state that they wanted to create in this partition, they recognized that, the, that a huge number of, of the population in the Jewish state would be Palestinian. And, and the expectation, of course, like the, the expectation was that these people would eventually be removed or leave. Hmm. Because you can't have a Jewish state with 50% of the population in Palestinian. Was, was that yeah. just... Was that written? Was that it was written in, 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 uh, in, in the first? No, it was just understood. Understood. Yeah. I mean, because in the end, you're partitioning a land which is overwhelmingly Palestinian, which was owned overwhelmingly. The land itself was actually owned overwhelmingly by Palestinians. You're dividing the land not in any ethical way that actually reflects that reality. You're dividing the land simply because you want to create a Jewish state. So again, the the priority for the Europeans and the Americans is create a Jewish state, and then. You know, to the best of our ability, we'll try to minimize the damage, even though we know the damage is going to be massive because you're going to dispossess people, the natives. But ultimately, it's the last, it's the first, in fact, and last settler colonial state that is legitimated by the UN. The UN, this, remember, this is a world without before decolonization, before the anti colonial waves of the 50s and 60s. Mm. So the UN was dominated by European and American states right. and the Soviets. And even prior to that, the League of Nations had, I think, somewhat acknowledged what was in the Balfour Declaration. Yeah, yeah. the League of Nations okay. embraced the Balfour Declaration, yeah. and the British had a partition plan. The first partition plan was the yeah. Peel Partition Plan of 1937, okay. which again divides Palestine into two states, but again privileges yeah. the Jewish state right. and gives the minority a huge amount of land. And the extraordinary thing about the Peel Commission, 1937, so this is 10 years before the UN partition plan. Right. This may be a lot of his history. No, no, this is really important. For your, for your listeners. No. But it's, this is all important. And again, yes. I encourage every single listener to go read the history because most Palestinians um, are not afraid of history because well, the history of the story is so, yeah. it's so basic. In 1937, when the British come to Palestine, after the Palestinian revolt, after decades of Palestinian protest, after the British had sent commission after commission after commission after commission saying, why are people upset with us? Oh, because they're being dispossessed. We need to do something, and nothing ever gets done. 
In 37, the British issue the first partition plan. It's called the Peel Partition Plan after Lord Peel. Mm -hmm. In that partition plan, if you go read it, and it's available on the on the UN website, you can find it anywhere. Go read, go read the go read the introduction or the preface. Just go read the preface. It's extraordinary. Um, and the conclusion. They they divide up Palestine into two states. Of course, understanding they say it. We know that this is going to be unfair to the Palestinian population. We know it because they're the ones who are being asked to give up their homes and lands to make way for a Jewish state. But we think Arabs are a generous people. They actually say something along these lines. They're a generous people. And so we hope that their generosity will help them or help, help I can't remember if it's help them or help us, redu or help them yeah. reduce the burden of this injustice. Because in the end, they're going to play a part, the Peel Commission says, in helping solve the world's so-called Jewish, uh, in, I think they use the word Jewish problem or right. Jewish question. But it's like it beyond, I mean, it's, it is extraordinary. Yeah. Honestly, the level, of, the level of hypocrisy, the level of tendentiousness, the level of, of, of um, dishonesty, and, and, and sheer uh, bitter irony of these people saying, we're going to, the Arabs are a generous people, they're hospitable people. So, you know, they're going to help solve what is in effect a European problem at yeah. their own expense. Right. It's, it's, it's honestly, and that same thinking, that same thinking is manifest in 47, of course, with the added urgency of what happened. I mean, the, the Holocaust, Holocaust and all that. The war has uh, ended. Uh, huh? The, the war has ended. The war has ended mm -hmm. in Europe. The mm -hmm. European war has ended. Yeah, that's right. It's beginning in Palestine. Sorry. Um, yeah, the war is that the World War II has ended, and the Europeans and the Americans are desperate just to put a stop and end to to the European issues. And of course, they're going to solve this problem of Jewish refugees and displaced persons again at the expense of the Palestinians. Right. So go look at who voted for the UN partition plan, which mm -hmm. every one of the, the people like today don't know anything about. But go look at it. Go see how grotesquely unfair this partition is. Yeah. Go study the maps. Go study the history. Yeah. Go study the partition. Go read what they say. You look and you see that basically the Western European states all voted for partition, except Britain, which abstained because the Britain was, was the mandate authority. The US votes for. The US puts enormous pressure on various satellite states, uh, especially in Latin America, in South America, in the Philippines, to basically vote for. The Soviets vote for as well. Because remember, Zionism also had a socialist. It was a socialist aspect. And the Soviets were thinking, well, we can have yeah. an allied state here, perhaps. And the US also thought they would have an allied state. In it. So they're, they're, the, the Zionists are appealing to both sides. Um, and then who voted against? Every Arab state that was a UN member at the time, every East Mediterranean state that was a UN member at the time, and India that was a UN member at the time. Because they all understood that this was a grotesquely unfair mm. partition, extremely violent, and in the end, it was not going to resolve any problem. It was anti-democratic. It was extremely um, uh, unfair to the native right. population. And of course, it creates a stateless population called the Palestinians, the, the results of this partition plan. Right. I mean, and it's amazing when you, when you study the history. And the ethnic cleansing occurs immediately after so that it's not just the nineteen for the war of forty eight, which begins in May, formally between the Arab states and Israel. But the ethnic cleansing begins before nineteen forty eight. The most fa infamous massacre takes place in Deir Yassin before 19, uh, May nineteen forty eight, before the establishment of the state. Mm -hmm. Palestinians are being ethnically cleansed before because the Zionists put into action a plan to ethnically cleanse because this was the their, they thought their 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 opportunity. They were going to fight for their state. This was a, a, an extraordinary moment for them. The Arabs were divided. The West supports them. The Palestinians are basically don't have an army. They've already been crushed by the British in the 1930s. Their leaders have mostly been executed. The leaders who actually fought were executed. Or, I mean, they, they, had, they had no chance, the Palestinians. Yeah. And they were terrorized, um, just like what the Israelis are doing in Gaza today. They were terrorized, except you know, on a on a smaller scale compared to, of course, in terms of the, the, the tonnage now. that's being dropped on Gaza today. Mm -hmm. They were terrorized. So you massacre these people, you encourage them to leave, you uh, you kick them out in many instances. You ethnically cleanse them because the most important thing about ethnic cleansing, remember, is not just kicking them out; it's not allowing them back in. So the ethnic cleansing takes place before, during, and after the war of 1948. 
which is why Palestinians refer to this as the Nakba or the catastrophe. The Israelis refer to it as their war of independence. And again, in the, in the Western narrative, to go back to that Western narrative, mm -hmm. the story always begins with, oh, Israel is great and it's just. I mean, wait, hang on. And, and it's a recompense for anti-Semitism. They always ignore the fact that this Western sort of idea always comes at the expense of the Palestinians. And, and that, from an Arab and a Palestinian, and any person who reads this and knows this history, it's just morally outrageous that, you're, that the West is resolving or claiming to resolve its horrific history of anti-Semitism against European Jews at the expense of another non-European people. It's, ast it's astonishing. It right. really is astonishing. And, and yet, the narrative is there's no history to the Palestinians. They attack Israel because they hate Jews. This is a narrative that we're getting now. Yeah. And that there's no, we don't talk about colonialism. We don't talk about occupation. We don't talk about injustice. We talk about none of those things. We just talk about what happens in the immediate moment where Israel is attacked and Israel responds. And that's framed always in this kind of retaliation. And again, go read the history. Right. Go educate yourself is what I would tell anyone. So um, focusing on the geography now, because I know borders is going to become important. And so in, what is the 1948 boundary? What does that partition look like? Because And then I want to fast forward, get into 67, what yeah. happens after that, yeah. and then 1999 with the Oslo Accords. We could sure. probably, yeah, just... Well, I mean, very, very basically, brief, yeah. the, 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 the state of Israel that gets created as a result of the war that was launched um, um, against the Palestinians in 1948 that ethnically cleanse the Palestinians, the state of Israel that emerges is much larger than the UN allotted state according to the UN partition plan of 1947, much larger. And it's that war that creates the Gaza Strip in its current mangled geography. I mean, there was no such thing as the Gaza Strip as such. There were towns, but Gaza and all these towns were part of the rest of this region. There was no Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip is simply the part that the Egyptian army was able to hold on to um, in 1948 because the Egyptians entered the war like, uh, like uh, the Iraqis, like Syrians, like the Jordanians. Um, not that they had a, an effective fighting force, but they had enough of a force that they were able to hold on to Gaza. Um, and, and they administered Gaza between 1948 and 1967. Right. So that's Gaza. The West Bank, um, there was already before the war, there was a... a this is according, according to um, an Israeli historian by the name of Avi Shleim, who's at Oxford, who documented how uh, King Abdullah of Jordan, or the leader of Jordan at the time, uh, basically collaborated or colluded with the Zionists in the run-up to the war to basically say, okay, the deal is you can take most of Palestine, but the West Bank uh, and East Jerusalem in particular will... will Will, will be under my control. Okay. That was the deal. Uh, or something along those lines. Yeah. You can go read about all the right. details. But right. basically there was collusion. And that's the title of this book, Collusion Across the Jordan. Between, mm -hmm. between Abdullah, um, who of course was installed, um, and his family, the Hashemites, were installed in Jordan right. by the British. And, and Jordan had the only effective fighting force on the Arab side. And it was, of course, it was not in the service of the Palestinians. It was, common, it was officered by the British, a British man officered controlled the force and it was there to to defend the interests of the Hashemite monarchy and the British um at another at another step yeah, removed sure and so that that's that that's what happened and then the, the the Arab states were 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 in no they were all basically like Syria was relatively a new state yeah they had a very weak army the Lebanese had no army to speak of and didn't fight really um the Jordanians had an army but it was like again um not in the service of the Palestinian people and officered, as I said, by Club uh, uh, Pasha, as was named, the British officer who worked, of course, for the for the for the Hashemites and for the and for the British. And uh, the Egyptians had a, a massively ill-equipped army. Okay. And Abdel Nasser, Gamal Abdel Nasser, was fought in '48, and and like many Egyptian officers, was shaped by that experience. And there was an Iraqi detachment and a Saudi detachment. But the point is that the Arabs were were actually outnumbered eventually on yeah. the field of battle. Right. All these. Arab states, there was no, no real coordination, and they were defeated because the Zionists were organized, they fought, they, they had a plan, and they had leadership. 
Mm-hmm. And, and, they, so the, and, and the Palestinians were overwhelmed in their villages. Because that also becomes an argument that you, you, that you hear sometimes, which is like, well, you know. Arab states invaded. Exactly. Yeah, but, in 48. That's, but that's ridiculous. I mean, first of all, that's absurd. I mean, that's an absurd way to start the story. Yeah. You cannot start the story in 1948 just like Thank that. Thank you. Yeah, You've yeah. got to start the story with the mandate and with, with the Balfour Declaration and with right. the extraordinary injustice of creating a Jewish state at the expense of the native Palestinians. Mm-hmm. Once mm-hmm. you understand that, you understand why the Arab states, which were all relatively new, weak states, dependent on the British for yeah. the most part, why they felt compelled by their own populations to intervene in what every single Arab and every single Muslim and every single third world person who knows this history, and, every, and I would say any person of conscience who knows this history understands that what happened to the Palestinians was profoundly wrong and immoral. And in the Arab world, as you know, in the Islamic world, as I'm sure you know, this is a question of, it's very basic. Unlike in the West, you don't have to argue about Palestine. Everyone understands that it's right, wrong what happened to the Palestinians and that the imposition of a Jewish state at their expense was profoundly immoral. And, and the, the, nobody argues that point. That's just understood. Right, it's a right. basic point. And it's not born out of this sort of inherent uh, anti-Semitism. There I is mean, no inherent, <laughs> and it's not true. That we don't have that. There's no such exactly. thing as inherent anti-Semitism in our part of the world. There, that's not true. Exactly. Anti-Semitism and its racial model is a European. Mm-hmm. I, I, I insist on this. Absolutely. And, and it's it's important to understand this. And no, it's based on a sense of injustice. And people who say otherwise don't know history. Of they don't know the not. history after the same. No, uh, the saying, and I encourage Spanish you to go, Inquisition. Go, go yeah. read the go read history. And I uh, you know I'm not going to argue with people who just don't want to read history because there's no <laughs> point. There's no you can't convince somebody who's convinced that that you're not a being and not a historical yeah. human being. So anyway, so yeah. yeah, all that happened in 48 and, 48. and the Arabs were de- the Arab states were were, were defeated. Um, and you know Satar Husari who who I wrote about in my last book Age of Coexistence who was a, an Iraqi a brilliant Iraqi um, well he was an Ottoman Syrian and, and then he goes eventually to Iraq um, and he he set up the Iraqi educational system a sec- a modern educational system in Iraq to fight both against what he considered to be antiquated uh, Islamic forms of education, the Quranic schools, and the British colonial sort of racist sort of division. Mm. And because he wanted a secular modern education like you have like in other, other countries. He really wanted to establish that. And he was asked, how could five Arab or whatever, five or six Arab armies lose? And his answer was because there were five or six Arab armies. In other words, the Arabs were not united at an official level. They were separated and divided up, and they were not an effective fighting force, and they lost. And as a result of losing that war, the Palestinians who had been expelled before the war and during the war yeah. were expelled again after the war as well. And most of all, they were not allowed, despite the fact that they have a right under international law to return to their homes, they were not allowed to return to their homes. And that creates a Palestinian refugee population and a stateless Palestinian population. These are basic facts. Everyone needs to know these facts. And again, I could elaborate for hours, but I I would urge every listener to go read. Um, So then I guess fast forward then to 67, and I don't want to gloss over anything major, but I think we could probably- There is a war in 56, but that's okay. Oh, okay, sorry. And there is, that's okay. We don't, we can gloss over that. That's when Israel, Britain, and France decided to invade Egypt um, which, which again, it's always negated in the, in the American imagination. Yeah, thank it, you. So, no, I think it is worth mentioning yeah. then. Well, so. I mean, the fact that the British and the French, the British hated Abdel Nasser, the Egyptian right. leader, because he nationalized, uh, because he was helping the Algerians in their war of liberation in Algeria, mm-hmm. the FLN. The British hated Nasser because he nationalized the Suez Canal. And because, of course, they hated any independent Arab or any third world leader who was actually independent. And the Israelis hated Nasser because, of course, Nasser represented the potential to unify uh, the Arabs uh, in strong nationalist leadership, and mm. and he and also understood that you needed an army, mm. and he got weapons from the Soviet, from the Eastern Bloc, from Czechoslovakia specifically. When the West turned him down, and wouldn't support him in the building of the Aswan Dam, uh, of the Aswan Dam, um, and they didn't like his his non-aligned movement, and they considered him too close to the communists, even though Nasser smashed the communists and it was terrible to the communists, as he was to the Muslim Brotherhood yeah. in Egypt, of course. He persecuted a lot of his people, but he was also an extraordinarily popular leader, unlike any Arab leader today. And so, and for those reasons, these three powers, Israel, the Britain, the British, and the French, conspired to invade Egypt in 1956, in October 1956. And the Americans and the Soviets actually together, or not, not exactly together, but both intervened and told them 
this this invasion cannot stand and will not stand and they forced them to withdraw and that was the sinai peninsula yeah okay that's when yeah. israel invaded the sinai the first right. time they did the same thing in 1967 that's right that's but why by then the I, west and the, the u.s was supporting israel completely i mean the u.s was supporting israel anyway even in 56 it just said hang yeah. on you can't just do this without a without telling us and b this is going to complicate our efforts you know to promote ourselves around the third world in our struggle with the soviets and so right. on and so forth and then so in 67 then um, israel I, invades the yeah. west bank and then again borders are adjusted because well they invade the west bank they invade right. gaza they invade the golan heights and they invade Jeru east jerusalem mm -hmm. and they take over and they immediately sort of declare they of course they they adjust the borders in the sense that they, that they they start their claim to jerusalem to the united what they That's called right. in, in israeli uh, official discourse and, and propaganda the eternal capital of the jewish people whatever they call it jerusalem so they unite under their military occupation they unite east jerusalem with west jerusalem and and what they do is they they, they divide up the palestinian population so that today decades after that 67 invasion and occupation of east jerusalem the west bank and gaza there is very different um statuses for the palestinian population in all of historic palestine so inside of israel the 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 population of palestinians who were not ethnically cleansed or who managed to stay behind and managed to acquire israeli citizenship and they're roughly about 20 percent today of the population of israel not the west bank not gaza just right. israel itself 20 percent palestinians in israel. inside people forget yeah. of course they forget yeah. and they're like and, and, it's, and it's a population that is massively discriminated against right. there's extraordinary racism against these people third class citizens of course mm -hmm. and they're and what propagandists for israel always say oh they have a right to vote yes they have a right to vote but so what i mean yeah, that's great but that's not that's not the issue they, they're also massively discriminated against in every sphere and, and they don't have access to land, a lot of the land, yeah. because remember, a lot of the land in Israel is held in perpetuity for the Jewish people. That's an important point. Yeah, and Israel defines itself legally not as a state of its citizens, but as a state of the Jewish people. So I have colleagues here, for example, who, by virtue of being Jewish, can go to Israel and become a citizen of Israel. But my mother, who's Palestinian, cannot go because she's Palestinian even though her history there is infinitely greater than the history of people who've never been there by definition and so so they 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 they're there but they're at least they have some rights constantly threatened and mm -hmm. they were under military rule for the first 10 years sorry from 48 to to 66 mm -hmm. they were under military rule inside of israel but they eventually were given citizenship as a way of placating you know trying to sort of uh, as a way of uh, placating western pressure on israel but also as a way of of uh, separating them from from other Palestinians, the idea is that you create them and you call them Israeli Arabs. So if you're, but if you're a Palestinian living in Israel, Israel, there's there's a there's a hard line between the West Bank Palestinians, Gaza Palestinians, and there's not like, yeah, so yeah, you you can I mean, as an Israeli citizen, you have certain privileges and rights that the Palestinians of the West Bank don't have. Correct. The Palestinians of East Jerusalem don't have, and the Palestinians of Gaza certainly don't have. That was just a, and in a moment in time, you got kind of bucketized, yeah, right? Yeah. Depending on where you were in yeah, that moment. Yeah. Okay. So the idea is that, I mean, yeah, for the Israeli state, and that's what Elon was saying, I mean, they want the most, the maximum land, minimum Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And so the ethnic cleansing gave them a, a Jewish majority, which then they, they, they like to pronounce as the, the only democracy in the Middle East. Of course, yeah. they ignore the, the history of this democracy is and what its reality is. Exactly. But in any case, there is the, um, Palestinians inside of Israel, it's important to understand that there are 20% of the population and right. they have certain rights of citizenship. Okay. As opposed to the Palestinians in East Jerusalem who are residents, they're given residency status in East Jerusalem, but they're not citizens. And so, and these are people who are constantly being ethnically cleansed today by the Israeli state, constant, as in you have to, 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 to get, your residency can be pulled for whatever reason, the Israeli—I mean, there's a whole bureaucracy that's designed to punish Palestinians, and there—and you can go talk to any Palestinian from East Jerusalem; they'll tell you these stories. The bureaucracy is there to catch any misstep, any mistake, anything that you do, you're going to lose your, your your residency, and once you lose your residency, you're finished, or you can't go back. As opposed to again, Jews from Europe or America or anywhere in the world who, just by virtue of being Jewish, can go to Jerusalem mm -hmm. and become Israeli. Yeah. I mean, the whole system is set up to 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 remove the palestinians in, in, in as, as as 
in bureaucratic matter, mm -hmm. in violent matter, in whatever it is. It's, uh, so, of course, Palestinians are not given permits, for example, to build homes. And so when they build a house, whether it's in East Jerusalem or in the West Bank, they're told, well, that's illegal and we're going to knock it down. From, a, from an Israeli perspective, they have these problems, right? Nuisance, nuisances of, or, or of people oh, for sure. and land. They yeah. want the land and they want the people yeah. out. Yeah, right. Yeah. And there's different priorities, and right? Right. Yeah. Right now, they're focusing on so the land, I guess, getting the people out by, right? I don't know. I'm trying to understand. No, they're doing that. both. They're doing yeah. both. I mean, so what, right now you have citizens in, in, in the 20 percent in Israel, and the Israelis often talk, openly talk about getting rid of them, about mm -hmm. ethnically cleansing even the Palestinian citizens who remain. Like, let's transfer them out. Let's exchange them for something. Let's do something with them. I mean, the the, the, the racist discourse, the actual physical suppression. The beatings, the shootings, the, yeah. the imprisonment, mm -hmm. the, the censorship is constant on Palestinians inside of Israel. Is that driving, even, the, even though they have citizenship rights. But is that actually driving them to the, the Palestinians to actually emigrate no, out or are they just no, kind of stuck? No, I mean, they're, they're, it's, like, it's like any people. I mean, they're, it's in, these are – some people leave, some people don't, but they're, yeah. still, they're still 20%. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a remarkable number given yeah. when you think about you know, the African-American population in this country. I don't know what it is. It's 12, 10? 13 percent. 12, 13 percent. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about 20 percent. That's after ethnic cleansing. In terms of that's a substantial percentage. And but then the you have only the point I wanted to make yeah. was about ethnic cleansing because I think this is another thing that I think when, when, when people hear that term, certainly I think from a Western perspective, it, it is both a violent and a nonviolent uh, enterprise. Correct. And I think what you've been alluding to, and it, this is all ethnic cleansing writ large. Like, of course. You know, the, the, yeah. the idea of third class citizens, the idea of, like you said, all types of uh, residents in the West Bank. And the in restrictions. Eastern, sorry, re they're, they're Palestinians who live in East Jerusalem, just to tell the residency. Yeah. They're, they're residents of East Jerusalem, but they're not citizens, whereas the Jews are citizens. Then you have. Any Jew. Well, any who can become a, I mean, right. if, any any Israel has something called the right of return. Yes, this is all kind of framed around one state versus two state solution. Right? But let me just finish if I yeah, can yeah, just yeah, quickly yeah. just for the listeners. So the West Bank don't have residency; they're just occupied. They have they they have no they have no they're just Palestinian subjects of Israeli military rule, and there's a layer of Palestinian authority, which that's Oslo. We can talk about that later. But basically, Definitely. they have no, and, and they're completely segregated into, the Israelis have cut them off from each other. They're not allowed into Jerusalem. They're not allowed into Israel, of course, unless they have permits, which the Israelis rarely give. And, and, and their movement is massively restricted. And of course, they're persecuted, harassed. There are pogroms against them and every single human rights report, mm -hmm. uh, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, even the Israeli human rights organization called Betselem all have said that the situation in between the river and the sea, between the River Jordan sure. and the sea, is an apartheid state because there's, there's two rules, two yeah. systems of law, one for Jews and one for yeah. not. For That's a very important point. Yeah. And, and, and then, then Gaza, 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 Gaza is the last part, yeah. which is a besieged, they have, they're, they're not citizens either. They're just a besieged subject population who are subjected to horrific violence. And I've been said, not just now, now, now it's genocidal violence, mm -hmm. but this has been going on in terms of the, the mass bombardments. When I think of my daughter, who's 17 years old, and, and her life, and she's here in, in Berkeley. I mean, she's in, she lives in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. um, and she goes to high school. The idea that she, her entire life, there are Palestinians who have lived and died and have been subjected to extraordinary bombardments their entire life, her entire life. They've she's never done. had a day of, 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 uh, of freedom. It's, it's obscene when mm -hmm. you think about what's going on. There's 2.2 million people crammed into the Gaza Strip, which is twice the size of Washington, D.C. It's a tiny area. It is inhumane what the Israelis and the Egyptians, the Egyptian state, but it's really the Israelis yeah. and the U.S. and the West and the Arab states, all of which have turned a blind eye to these people, but not people of conscience around the world, and especially in the Arab and the Islamic world, but people identify and understand what's going on. Uh, Gaza and the West Bank are separated by about 50 miles? Something like that. Something like that, right? Okay, so yeah, just again for people to situate, uh, and they can go look what at this map looks and they like. Can see it. But yeah, the yeah. Gaza Strip is on, is on the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, of course, and the Palestinians are not allowed to go to the Mediterranean. The Israelis blockade the Gaza Strip, right? And the Israelis control all the borders and they control the airspace. And of course, that's that's in no, the normal times, yeah. let alone the, the current sort of yeah. violence and genocidal violence that's being perpetrated against the people of Gaza. The West Bank is is a fragmented. Again, go look at any UN map. Go look at any human rights mm -hmm. report map, and you'll see the West Bank is fragmented. There are Jewish only roads. 
for the settlers. That is illegal Jewish colonists who are who moved into the West Bank after 1967. That's exactly where I wanted to go. Yeah, and talk about up, these illegal Israeli yeah, well, they settlements. They set up these, these so-called okay. these settlements, colonies, basically Jewish-only colonies. Um, and this stems Jews, from this idea that Jews anywhere worldwide have this right of passage to Israel. Well, it's not. It's 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 an Israeli law that it's called the right. Not the. Uh, it's called the sorry the law of return. Law of return. Law of return. I, yeah. I said right of return. The right oh. of return is what Palestinians yeah. are entitled to under UN yeah. and international law. So okay. the Palestinians who were expelled have a right under international law to return to their homes. Right. Of, of course, the United States and the European states ref and Israel refuse this category. Refuse categorically to implement that law. That's right. So That's Palestinians right. remain stateless. So um, the uh, the Israeli law of return mm -hmm. is this law which basically says that again Jewish people of good standing anywhere in the world can emigrate to Israel can become and become an Israeli citizen by virtue of being Jewish. Period. I mean, it's incredible yeah. when you think about it. So you have this thing, this program. I don't know if it's still around, but there was a program on college campuses. I don't know if yeah. it, it was called birthright. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, and I this the very that. term itself, birthright. So in other words, the idea that. In other words, yeah. if you are Jewish, you have a, a right by virtue of birth to mm. go to Israel. And the idea is like to get you to emigrate there and become an Israeli. It's, mm. it's extraordinary. And it's all premised on the denial and the erasure of the Palestinians and their indigeneity and their history on that land and their yeah. presence. Right. It's all, and it's all, so that's the situation. It's, it's incredibly deplorable. So it's, when people tell you about Hamas, not Hamas, Hamas did not exist until 1987. Israel turned a blind eye to Hamas's creation because it was trying to it was trying to weaken the PLO, the secular PLO. Yeah. So the Israelis, after 1967, they they uh, uh, encouraged, in violation of international law, in violation of the Geneva Conventions, in violation of of the idea that you're not allowed to transform a property under military occupation, which is what well West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem were mm. and are considered under international. No matter what the United States says, it's not true. It's that these these are I mean. The United States says the uh, says now, has now recognized under Trump, and of course Biden didn't reverse this outrageous decision to recognize the annexation of the Golan Heights, um, um, and move the embassy to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, um, but in any case, the so the Israelis are obviously in violation of it. And there's there's no there's no again there's no doubt about this from an international legal perspective. They have moved their citizens into Jewish citizens into the West Bank. They have taken the land of others, of the Palestinians. They have dispossessed the Palestinians. They've created Jewish-only colonies, and they connect those colonies to Israel itself. They've, they've annexed Jerusalem, East Jerusalem. They've expanded the municipal boundaries of Jerusalem. They put huge pressure on the Palestinians inside Jerusalem, the residents, remember those residents we're yeah. talking about, to leave, to, to harass them, to not renew their residency. Any slip that you make, you're out. Whereas the opposite, of course, is the case if you're Jewish. Not to mention the, the amount of prisoners. Oh, there's 5,000 yeah. prisoners, right. and there's been a million, Ilan Pape said this, that a million Palestinians Since the creation. Yeah. have gone through the Israeli prison system, political prisoners, which is yeah. an extraordinary number. Um, but you know, the Israelis have something called administrative detention, where they can, they can hold you in prison for months on end without actually, without a trial. Um, they arrest children routinely. Uh, they, 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 it's, a, it's a horror story. It's a catalog of horror. I don't want to get into all the horrors. Uh, sure. of, of, but you can just, again, educate yourself, the listeners. Go read. You can, there, there's a fantastic film. There are many different films that have come out recently um, that, that give people a glimpse of life under occupation. One was called The Present, which mm -hmm. appeared last year or two years ago. It's a short 20-minute video. It was on Netflix. A fantastic mm -hmm. film. Uh, really powerful. Mm -hmm. um, it gives you a sense of just how degrading and dehumanizing life is for Palestinians. Mm -hmm. You know that the Israeli settlers, by virtue of being Jewish, are have access to the land and the aquifers of the West Bank, the water resources, and they have the protection of the Israeli army. <clears throat> they can travel where they want. They can go whenever they want. And the Palestinians, <clears throat> excuse me, who are the native population, are basically in reservations, towns yeah. that are cut off from one another. You can't even go from town A to town B oftentimes because the Israelis block the roads. Mm -hmm. They have checkpoints everywhere. They harass, they intimidate, they shoot, they murder, they kill. That's another thing about October 7th is that the Israelis have killed dozens of Palestinians in the West Bank before October 7th this year. There were pogroms. Actually, the Israelis themselves said, I mean, there were, there were pogroms against Palestinian villages in the West Bank. I mean, I don't know how much more people need to know. I mean, they, yeah. the, the, the amazing thing to me is how blatant and obvious the record is.
and how people still put their heads in the sand in the West. Not not <laughs> all people, because there's a change. You see, there's a, there's a shift taking place. And, and I want to get to that. Give me well. some yeah. some some shred of hope, some glimmer of hope, hope so. is that young people yeah. seem to be understanding far more than older people what's going on. So I want to talk a, a little bit now about uh, the on the Palestinian side because I think the, for a lot of people, again, for lay people, from especially from a Western perspective, it seems pretty fragmented in terms of those who represent Palestine, Palestinian interest. You have the PLO, you have the Palestinian Authority, mm-hmm. Hamas. Maybe we can even discuss Hezbollah, you know, from the north in Lebanon. Who am I forgetting? Uh, Islamic Jihad. You know, these are all Fatah. These are all names that you hear. So maybe... Well, first, first yeah. Palestinians are a stateless population. That's the first and crucial point to understand. <laughs> Thank you. B, they're refugees. Uh-huh. C, they are fragmented. So the leadership, insofar as it has now been... That's part of what the Israeli strategy has been for decades. Divide up the Palestinians into various groups. Separate Gaza from the West Bank separate the Palestinians inside Israel from the West Bank and from East Jerusalem, separate and the refugees outside. There are millions of Palestinians yeah. outside right. who have a right of return under international law to what were their homes right. and their lands. Um, so the, the Israeli strategy is basically separate the Palestinians into various groups and deal with them, each one, separately. Because then you can bring the whole weight of an oppressive state against a single group. So in that context of fragmentation, statelessness, oppression, um, uh, brutalization, there are, of course, there are divisions among the Palestinians. And so you have a major division between the PA, the Palestinian Authority, which was created as a result of the Oslo Accords, yeah. which were signed in 1993. And the idea was that this, uh, which, which actually helped the Israelis institute apartheid in the West Bank by fragmenting the West Bank to areas A, B, and C. There's that sort of uh, PA which has lost all legitimacy, as far as I can tell, among Palestinians, because it's basically a collaborationist authority. That's Abbas. Yeah, Mahmoud Abbas, who's like, like, I don't know how old he is, but he's certainly uh, not a representative leader. He's a representative of corruption, is what he is, and of of an extraordinarily corrupt, broken system that the United States and Israel and the Europeans and the Arab states have helped keep afloat because they provide security. Yeah. for the occupation. They're mm-hmm. basically contractors for the Israeli occupation. The native collaborators is what they are. And you know, it's and the idea of course Arafat when he first signed this accord in his maybe fantasy, he thought that was going to be a first step towards the, the a two-state solution. Okay. Well, that never came about because the Israelis basically flooded the West Bank from 1993 to 2000 until today in fact. They flooded the West Bank with Jewish settlers, colonists. Yeah. They built more colonies illegal, under international law, um, segregationist in their nature, um, in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem. And the idea is we're going to, the Israelis, and that was, the, the Israelis were open about this. They're going to destroy any possibility. And they have, in fact, destroyed any possibility of a so-called two-state solution. So the two-state today is just a, a, a myth. It's words that get used by Western politicians and Israeli politicians to pretend that there is a solution, but there's no solution. Everyone understands that the two-state solution is dead. It's gone. Mm. It's finished. The Israelis have made it impossible because they want the land. They want the West Bank. They want East Jerusalem. They just don't want the Palestinians. So for the Israelis, you're asking what their end game is. The reason the end game is basically keep the Palestinians subjugated. And that, as far as they're concerned, this is the great sort of paradox, absurdity of the Israeli position is that you're going to keep the Palestinians who are millions of people subjugated in perpetuity? Do they really think that that's going to happen? Mm. No. That's, I mean, that's not going to happen. Because people, no people in the world, no people accept their fate forever. Nobody does. Especially not millions of people on their own land. Yeah. So that's the situation where we're in today. So Hamas emerges as a symptom of a problem of occupation and injustice and statelessness and oppression. And it has one idea of what, you know, how to resist. You can agree, you can disagree, you can say they're horrible, you can say they're terrible, you can say they're, it's loathsome, it's odious, whatever. But that's not the point is, if you start the story with Hamas, you're missing the point. Exactly. Mm. Right. You're deliberately missing the point, especially when someone is trying to educate you. Go read the history and understand Hamas comes decades after the occupation commenced. Yeah. And the occupation is brutal, inhumane, and illegal. So, and then Hamas, uh, the, there's the election in 2006. 
yeah, so-called election. Election yeah. as in the sense of you're talking about a stateless population that's, right. that's being told that you can have some form of representation in these fragmented areas. So yes, in 2000, so, uh, and um, Hamas won in Gaza. Like, in other words, they won as in they, they had, they, 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 it was basically a protest vote against the corruption of the PA. Okay. And, and then the... And then the, the West and the Israelis, uh, the Israelis basically blockaded they refused to accept that, and they, said, and they blockaded uh, Gaza. It is the longest blockade in modern history. Right. And what you were talking about, about your daughter being 17, I mean, that's what starts in 2006. Yeah. Right. It's, it's unbelievable. The brutal, yeah, the brutalization and occupancy, uh, the bombardment and uh, been, all. I think there have been five, if I'm not mistaken, there have been five major Israeli bombardment campaigns on the population of Gaza who are 2.2 million today, overwhelmingly children like mostly the children it's a yeah. population that's 43 percent, i think under 18 not over yeah. one but 43 percent, which is a huge number uh when you think about that and you think about the fact that these people have lived their entire lives under in a prison no rights yeah. no ability to leave uh the israelis control the calories that go into the gaza strip yeah i mean it's it's the it's it's beyond inhumane it's dis disgraceful what's the I, I'm still trying to understand. There has to be some strategic end game from the Israeli government point of view. They, they thought, okay, we wall them off. Yeah. We wall them off. We forget about them. The way they built a wall all around the West Bank. Think about that illegal wall, the apartheid wall they built all throughout the West Bank on Palestinian territory, by the way, of course, in violation again of international law. In many instances, twice the size of the Berlin Wall. Uh, and yet the West has just pretended, oh, it doesn't happen. It doesn't so, matter. So doesn't by happen. bombing Gaza now, essentially... There's an Israeli geographer. Uh, my brother wrote a book called Sadi, who's at UCLA, Professor Makhdesi at UCLA. Sorry, there's another one of us. <laughs> um, and he wrote a book. He just published a book. It's called uh, Tolerance is a Wasteland, mm. the Culture of Denial, uh, Palestine and the Culture of Denial. And it's about how, how the, the, the wall, in particular, he talks about the wall. And if you look at the wall on the Israeli side, they often and sometimes it's, they have, they have, they've landscaped it such that it sort of blends in so you can't see just how monstrous that wall is. So they've landscaped it up, and then they've painted it in some areas. Whereas on the other, on the Palestinian side, it's just this brutal edifice of 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 denial, an iron wall, yeah. even the denial of I'm not a concrete wall, but an iron yeah. wall metaphor. It's just this 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 brutal edifice that says we, you are never going to get out. You are trapped in here. Open and, air prison. Yeah. yeah, but I'm talking about the West Bank now. Oh, sorry. So sorry, this sorry. is in the West yeah, Bank. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. Gaza, it's an open air prison. Yeah. The West Bank, it's it's prisons. Ah, in right. And it's yeah, not yeah. not as not as brutal as 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 Gaza because Gaza gets bombed all the time um, because Hamas dares resist. And this gets us to this question of Hamas and all that. I mean, in the end, as Let's long as Palestinians yeah. exist, you're mm -hmm. asking what the end game is. As long as they exist, Omar, as long as they exist, they're going to resist. Living people resist their oppression. Every living people in history have always resisted their oppression. They may be brutalized for a, a, a decade. They may be crushed, but they come back, especially when you think about between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. In other words, all of historic Palestine, Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem, 50% of the population today is Palestinian. It's extraordinary. And we're not even talking about the refugees who are outside, yeah. the millions of refugees who are outside the Palestinians or those who've taken up um, uh, citizenship of other states. It's remarkable. 50%. The Nakba, the whole point of the Nakba from the Zionist fantasy perspective was get rid of the Palestinians and take the land. Now they've taken the land because of their occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. 50% of the population between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean is Palestinian. Mm -hmm. So what do the Israelis plan with them? This is, the, this is what gets denied, erased completely in all the discussions about October 7th. The Israeli plan is keep the Palestinians in Gaza in a prison. Kill them as necessary. Every time they rise up, you smash them. Do you remember a few years ago when they had a march, a peaceful march to the border, to, their, to the border of, of, of Israel? Yeah. Like the, what, you know, in other words, what used to be their own lands, because most of these Palestinians in Gaza are refugees or descendants right. of refugees. Right. The Israeli snipers shot them. Do you remember this? Yeah. When Trump was president. That's right. They shot them. I mean, we're talking about, they were shot. Like, it's incredible, the brutality of the Israelis vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, the dehumanization mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. The Israeli minister called them uh, human animals. Human animals. Yeah. Okay. Benjamin Netanyahu described them as children of darkness. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's, it's a level of dehumanization. And so the idea is, you keep them, in, and now what's happening to them now is they're being pulverized in Gaza. 
And the idea is ideally, from an Israeli perspective, I guess, is you put enough pressure on Egypt that Egypt has to open up its borders and push the Palestinians into the Sinai. And they think that's going to resolve the problem. It's not. I think you very like masterfully got us to where we are now, October 7th, and then the, you know, the aftermath. But leading up to October 7th, even, what's happening, uh, because this has also been talked about in the media, what was happening within Israeli sort of politics? You had judicial I mean, reforms with yeah. Netanyahu and, and well, Netanyahu. I mean, everybody knows everybody. Everybody. In, I mean, my, my sense is that yeah. many Israelis. I mean, I can't speak for Israelis, honestly. Sure. So they can speak for themselves. Right. But my sense is that many Israelis, um, especially those who are on the more liberal side, are deeply worried and were deeply worried by Netanyahu because not only was he notoriously corrupt, mm -hmm. um, but also he. Um, he has, you know, he's, he's extremely right wing and he has put in his government. I mean, Israeli government has always been racist towards Palestinians from day one. It's always been racist towards Palestinians, always. But now you have people who are not just racist, but they, they are, they revel in their racism. There's actually a, a party, if I'm not mistaken, it's called Jewish Power. It's one of the coalition partners of the Netanyahu government. I mean, these are people who are, who are like fascists, open fascists. Mm. And so people in Israel are like, wait, what, what's going on here? Right. And the judicial reform, I mean, the Israeli Supreme Court has been nothing but hostile to Palestinians from the beginning. Nothing but hostile to the Palestinians. But Netanyahu and his coalition partners, right wing, his super right wing coalition partners, think that, that that's still not good enough. You, you need to, even that is not, you know, that, that the few tiny little sort of band-aids that the Supreme Court puts on some of the most egregious and brutal aspects towards the Palestinians is not enough yeah. to get rid of them. And so, but that, that's an internal Israeli, I would say Jewish, Israeli yeah. Jewish. Uh, there is, uh, there was a lack of, there was, there were beginning to be divisions, major divisions. Right. What kind of country do you want? What kind of Israel do you want? And, and you know, there are Israelis, like Ilan Pape could speak to this much more eloquently than me. Uh, but of course, it's all premised on ignoring the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. As Ilan said in his lecture the yeah. other day, right. it's all premised on ignoring the Palestinians. Whether you want a right-wing Israel, whether you want a theocratic Israel, or you want a secular liberal Israel, it's all premised on the erasure of the Palestinians. And this pretense, this kind of fantasy that you can somehow have a normal state with five million people as your subjects, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. it, it won't work. It can't work. Right. And that's what exploded on October 7th. So again, all the horrors of violence, all that, acknowledging all the horrors, of October 7th and everything around October 7th, it, what ex the, the, the reality is you cannot understand that moment without understanding the whole history that comes before it. Yeah. Just like you cannot understand a slave uprising or rebellion simply by looking at the uprising and ignoring the history of slavery. It just doesn't work that way. You cannot understand the history of the FLN or the, or the, uh, uh, the Indian nationalists fighting against British colonialism in India or, or any anti-colonial movement by simply focusing on the moment of violence and not the history that, that leads up to that moment and that provokes that violence. Absolutely. It's impossible. And in the West, the, the mainstream media and the US president in particular, but the European states also, yeah. awful in this respect. Honestly, right. they, have, they, have, they have gone out of their way to pretend that there is no history worth knowing before Hamas terrorists, and they're, they're, that's the phrase they keep using, the, the evil Hamas terrorists who came out of the blue, they didn't come out of Gaza, they didn't come out of history, they didn't come out of oppression, they didn't come out of uh, an extraordinarily uh, inhumane siege of Gaza, they came out of the blue, literally. And they killed uh, these people uh, simply because they hate. Right. And that's the absurd the reductive and drawing narrative. parallels to like Nazis. the Holocaust. Yeah. I mean, it's even like when Joe Biden says this is as consequential as the Holocaust. That's the phrase he used. I yeah. mean, that's just again, it's absurd at one level. Yeah. On the other hand, it is terrifying because what he's actually saying is that what happens then to the Palestinians in Gaza is fully deserved because we're fighting the Nazis. And, and it's not just Biden. I mean, it's Western. Not just Biden. Yeah, it's, all, it's 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 the West in general. The, the Western countries are are have been. I mean, it's 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 from a, from a, a secular perspective, yeah. as in secular. I don't mean secular, just as not not anti-religious, but secular, yeah. as in accepting that every human being is Correct. equal. From any, it's the racism that has come out in the West, yeah, has been shocking. It's shocking to see how racist they, the Western states have been.
And yet, I want to end on a, on a point of hope at some point. What you see is, is how many young people, how much pushback there is. Right. So I was going to say, like, they, 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 they try to suppress, yeah. they try to control the narrative. They always try to control the narrative. Yeah. And always, no history, no context. As soon as you historicize, as soon as you contextualize, as soon as you humanize the Palestinians, it's, it's, um, the, the, it, the, the stakes become so clear. The justice of the Palestinian cause becomes so clear. And that's why progressive left, or I don't, I don't want to use left or right, but I'll just say progressive anti Zionist Jews join the coalition for Palestinian freedom because they understand that that's freedom also for their community as well. Anyone with, 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 a, with a shred of, 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 of decency understands that this situation today is completely untenable and that the cause of this situation is the colonial violence that's been perpetrated against the Palestinians. So then let me ask you then, so uh, what does decolonization look like to you? Uh, right now, I mean, right now, oh, Colonial Zionism has to has to end. Okay. There's just no doubt in my mind about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt, and mm -hmm. I mean, and that means, and a state of, for of equality for every single person, Muslim, Christian, or Jewish, has to be implemented. But that, I'm not even in that. I mean, that's just you're asking me like, uh, like that's a fantasy. I know. I, mean, I know. Right. Right now, it's really about survival. Right now, we're in a phase of survival. Uh, in other words, and and the idea. Let's see what happens. We're still in the middle right now of. of we don't know what's going to happen right now in Gaza. We're really hearing Israeli, they, about escalation. Huh? I said we're hearing about escalation from the Israeli side. Well, the Israelis are. What do you mean? Ask, beyond what they've like already beyond, done. Beyond, like, yeah. they've, they've, saying, they've already well, killed. As I said, they've already yeah. killed or wounded. Uh, according to, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, twenty thousand people. Yeah. The next phase. You Whatever. keep hearing. Yeah, you know, the quote unquote. Yeah, next phase. Be, but there's also there are other things that go in history. Happens in in sort of ways that people don't predict. That's right. And politics, we don't know what's going to happen. The Israelis thought they were going to destroy Hezbollah in two thousand six, and they, they ended up being defeated by Hezbollah in two thousand six. Mm -hmm. And that is so. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. Right. You don't know what's going to happen. There's so many things that are still yet to unfold. But all you know that what is happening now is that you have an innocent population of Palestinians who are trapped in the Gaza Strip, right. who have been dehumanized and, de and brutalized in the most extraordinary fashion. Aided and abetted by the U.S. government, right? Because it's the U.S. government that actually provides the material, political, diplomatic, military, and ideological support for this completely unconscionable, inhumane state of affairs. And so, in terms of solutions, of course, I want I, I want equality for everyone. And the, and so, when we talk about, I said that colonial Zionism has to end. There has to be a new formulation of 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 of, of Zionism in a different way entirely. It cannot be this kind of racist colonial structure. Okay. It's just, it, this yeah. is untenable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And people understand that. And you cannot brutalize five, six million people forever. I mean, that's the history of, of, of Hamas. If anything, it tells us that Hamas didn't exist. The Palestinians never had the, they, they, they've been brutalized now more than they've ever been brutalized. They're still there. Yeah. And they're going to be there in three weeks' time. They're going to be there in a month's time, in a year's time. And then what? You cannot have a normal society and brutalize half its population. You yeah. just can't do it. Right. I think we've seen two things, um, broadly speaking, after the uh, October seventh attacks. Power brokers, those in the in, in corridors of power, they remain sort of stenographers for Israeli policy and and specifically the Likud government of Netanyahu. But what I think, in terms of hope. Uh, or a sign of hope that I've seen is this sort of groundswell of support among young people, what we're seeing in college campuses, the millions of people that are showing up to large, you know, cities around the world 100%. and protesting. So I think that is something that at least in my, in my lifetime, I haven't seen prior to this, that sort of galvanized groundswell of support. I mean, would you agree? Yeah. In the context of, of an extraordinary campaign of intimidation and censorship. I mean, here, oh, at, at, where you see Berkeley, there's a professor at law school. Yeah. Here. Who had an editorial or a, an opinion piece in the yes, Wall Street Journal last week, where he actually said, "Don't hire my students." Like, <laughs> what kind of professor says that? Honestly, right. like objectively, it's right. it's it's not to mention those Harvard Harvard students. Not who, to mention the intimidation, yeah. not the doxing of students, doxing the, of students, the constant the constant intimidation and the pressure, the the the, the accusation is of anti-Semitism. Yeah, it's it's yeah. In, it's incredible mm -hmm. what's happening. And mm -hmm. yet, despite all that, despite all that, what you see is. Young people are protesting. Yeah. They refuse to be silenced. They refuse to be intimidated. And not only that, it's a coalition. It's not just Palestinians. It's people of all faiths and backgrounds. And that's what you see. You see it most clearly on college campuses. Um, an extraordinary coalition that refuses to be cowed into submission 
by this kind of uh, this 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 honestly this 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 response by the Zionists uh, or those who identify with Israel who think somehow that this is a Holocaust part two because this is how they framed it to themselves. Yeah, uh, and people are saying this is ridiculous. This is about basic. Ultimately, it's not about October seventh. It's about what underlies. It's about the history and the and the colonial context right. and the lack of equality yeah. and the inhumanity of what's happening. And our, the, I'm not the our side, but the, but the young people who you see protesting yeah. in the face of extraordinary pressure, in the face of a national uh, U.S. government and the Western, as you said earlier, Western governments that overwhelmingly support Israel, in the face of university campus leaderships, so-called right. leaderships, I put it in quotation marks, please, leaderships that have betrayed their ethical yeah. uh, and moral responsibilities, educators, by by grieving publicly for Israeli victims and ignoring Palestinian victims. Not grieving for victims, not saying our campus is a place to learn and to educate yourselves, but taking sides in the most crass and crude way. Oh, absolutely. That's what's happened across U.S. campuses. Yeah. Despite that, yeah. and the mainstream media that you guys know more than me. Mainstream media, em employers, I mean, corporations. And, and, and corporations and everything. The, the type of all statements. That, mm -hmm. All that, people are still coming out. Yeah. Okay, so that tells you something. That tells you that young people, A, are, are, not, are not blinded yeah. by what, they want a better world. And part of a better world is not just fixing the environment and sort of staving off this massive environmental crisis that we're all facing. It's also, yeah. it's also being ethical beings yeah. in relationship to what's going on in Palestine. Because nobody who's ethical, whether you're Muslim, Christian, Jewish, or any other faith, and is profoundly ethical, can accept what's going on now to the Palestinians. Nobody can accept that. So I'm going to ask you to step out of your comfort zone as a historian, and, and again, you've just the history you've elucidated, you know, in the last uh, 90 minutes or so, it's just been remarkable to maybe think about like where do we go from here like what happens now all like all the, all that can happen now is that every individual has an ethical responsibility that's how what i believe so okay. it's not about what happens now where we go depends. in terms of like a global it depends it depends on the forces of it depends on the forces of justice arrayed against the forces in terms of palestine specifically right, against right. the forces who support uh an ethno-religious nationalist state that was invented in europe and imposed through colonialism on the native population, and that sustains itself through mass violence against this population. And it's a choice. And the, the, the beautiful thing that I see is how many people, white people, people of color, I mean, I'm, this all, you know, I don't, I'm not singling out like a single, but Muslim, Christian, Jewish, um, people from South Asia, from Africa, everywhere, Latin America, everywhere, even Europe and America, coming out in support and in solidarity with the Palestinians. That tells you something remarkable. Yeah. So I, th I, th I have. I mean, I don't want to end on a sort of Pollyannish note and say, "Oh, it's all going to be great." No, it's their horrors are before us. We're living now in an age yeah. of horror. It's happening to Gaza. It's it's so unconscionable to me. It's so shocking. Uh, but everyone has an ethical, individual responsibility as well to look at this, to read about this, and to grapple with this with this reality, and then make their own judgments. Something you've mentioned throughout, and and you just mentioned about reading up on this. A any sort of uh, a list, if you will, of, of books that you would recommend, just or, off the top or, of your head, or a film. You mentioned the yeah, present yeah. on the Netflix. Present. I would yeah. look at the present. Go look at the present. It's a film that came out a few years ago uh -huh. on Netflix. It's twenty minutes. So uh -huh. for the listeners, it's short, uh -huh. and and for it's it's really it's it just captures the the, the dehumanization of the occupation and also the resilience of people who live there. Uh -huh. um, in, in 20 minutes, it's 25 minutes. It's a fantastic film. So okay. I would look at the present. I would, I would just read. I mean, I can't, it's, there's so many books yeah. to read. You could, but I always tell my students, read widely. The more, the more widely you read, uh, read widely, read Palestinians, read Israelis, read anyone, frankly. The more you read, the more you'll, you'll realize that what I've been saying is actually far closer, is, is honestly, an, is an, I really believe is an honest approximation. Of, of our past. Right. There's right. no doubt in my mind. Dr. McDessey, thank you so much for your time. This has been really illuminating to sit and record on an early Sunday morning. Can't thank you enough. Where can people maybe read up on your articles and, and books and publications? Where can people find you sort of on, online, if you will? Uh, I came across you on Twitter, so I know you're pretty active yeah, there. I'm on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, you can just 
go to the Berkeley website. Sure. I, I have a website which I haven't actually established. Any. Okay, you know, I'm, I'm really lazy on this stuff. But yeah, yeah just, you're not the you, first you, academic to say yeah, that. So you can just Google and, and find. You'll find okay. tons of articles okay. that I've written and things. Been but a real thank pleasure. You. I appreciate. I appreciate the the opportunity to speak to you guys. That was a really highly illuminating conversation. Thank you so much again, Dr. McDC. Uh, listeners, as always, you can hit us up at, at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. If you have questions, comments, uh, please go visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash diffusecongruence. Check us out on social media. And as always, you'll catch us on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. Thank <laughs> you.